Well, it, uh, it's time for us to turn our attention to God's Word. And I'm very excited to be in a service that has no particular ending time in mind. I heard a couple of people say amen to that. Here's what I want to say. I want to say thank you, Father, for your faithfulness to this church. Thank you, Father, for your faithfulness to your word. Thankful, thank you, Father, for your faithfulness to yourself. I'm reminded that the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. From the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, the Lord's name is to be praised. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it, and they are saved. The Lord God is a sun and a shield. No good thing will he withhold from him who walks uprightly. We are troubled on every side, yet not in distress. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We are persecuted, but not forsaken. We are struck down, but not destroyed, always bearing about in our bodies the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our bodies. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. One generation shall praise your name to another. Holy, holy, Holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Make a joyful noise to the Lord. Serve the Lord with gladness. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord is God. He is the one that has made us and not we ourselves. We are his children and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name for the Lord is good. I'm thankful for each one of you. I praise God for every special guest who is here, every pastor and church planter who has joined us. I praise God for every church and congregation represented by one of these flags. And we give God praise. This is the Lord's doing. Say it to your neighbor. This is the Lord's doing. Say it again. This is the Lord's doing, the psalmist said. And it is marvelous in our eyes. Praise the Lord. So much has changed at Harvest over these years. We're talking again with Rick and Lynn last night and praying here when none of y'all were here and how the Lord has changed so much and how we are changed. But some things must never change. And if you would indulge me just for a moment before we open our Bibles, I'd like to read to you the paragraph that a 27-year-old young man read to a brand new congregation in September of 1988. These are the first words that ever came out of a preacher's mouth in this church. Here's how I began. Standing in the pulpit this morning, I am conscious of the fact that if God has his way, we will often look back to this day with great rejoicing. In view of that, I want you to know that everything that I have to say to you today has been generated through my study of and reflection upon a specific passage in God's Word. I guess I want people to know at the outset that I have no intention of standing up here and telling you what I think about this or that, as though my opinion should carry more weight than anyone else's. I believe that this book is the Word of God, and by that I mean that every single word within its pages was communicated by God through various authors for our instruction. I believe that the Bible is the absolute inerrant truth and the final authority for Christian living. Many people give lip service to biblical authority but deny it in their practice. God helping me and us, this will never be true at Harvest Bible Chapel. I said it then, 
and I recommit myself now. I commit myself to the faithful proclamation of the truths of God's word so that the people whom God entrusts to our care will have a solid foundation of truth to build their lives on. I affirm before you today my conviction that the answers to mankind's deepest problems, whatever we are facing, are found in God's word. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Father, what we have pledged ourselves to, we pledge ourselves to again. And as our Savior said, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. And so we ask, God, that you would help us to delight ourselves in your word. We pray, Father, that you would cause your word to increase in us. We pray that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. And minister to every person here now as we open your word, we ask in Jesus' name. Lift up your voice and say it. Amen. All right. You know, we've been in our church. We've been in the gospel of John, and there's so much great stuff coming this fall. I can hardly stand it. I look in the calendar. Oh, I can't wait for that week. I can't wait for that week. I can't wait for that week. And is it okay if I just steal one little great part that's coming now and we'll just go over it again? Can I do that? We're actually at the beginning of John 13 in our study, Authentic Jesus, but I'd like to uh, preach today on one verse. Um, let me read six verses and then the verse I want to emphasize. This is a very simple message, but it's a life-changing message. Let's give our attention to God's word now. John 14, 1, Jesus said, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you that I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself that where I am there, you may be also. And you know the way to where I am going. Thomas said, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. Now, I don't know how familiar you are uh, with God's word. You may have been studying it for years. You may be new to God's word. You may not even have a copy. You may be sharing with someone near you. Maybe you have no way of knowing that I just read one of the most radical things that anyone has ever spoken, one of the most important verses in all of the Bible, John 14, 6. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. Again, I am the way, Jesus said, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. I just got three thoughts and about 30 sub-thoughts under each one of those things. It's so simple, start here. Jesus Christ is the way, bow to him. Every person here needs to bow to Jesus Christ. If you haven't bowed to him now, you have the amount of time uh, left in your life for you to make that choice. Every person must bow to Jesus Christ. Those who do not bow willingly here on this earth will be forced to bow in eternity. But the Bible says that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. God's going to get that out of every mouth. Life is an awesome opportunity to bow willingly. Check this phrase when Jesus said, I am the way. Those two words, I am. The two-word revelation of God's personal name to Moses now on the lips of second person son. When Jesus said, I am, the two words that God used to reveal himself in Exodus, he was declaring himself to be one with God the Father. They knew what he was claiming. Jesus Christ, not just a good teacher, not just a healer, not just a moral man, but the very son of God who came as an atoning sacrifice for our sin. As we've been going through John, we've been learning the seven I am statements. I am the bread of life. 
I am the light of the world. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. Now, I'm not sure who counted up these seven, but here we have three, but they're only counted as one. This is the next one. Staccato. I am the way, the truth, the life. I am, I am, I am, Jesus said. Way, truth, life. Awesome. N notice, not I was the life. Not I will be the life. Jesus said, I am the life. Self-existent, eternal, the same. Hebrews 13, 8. Jesus Christ, the same. Yesterday, today, and forever. A hundred generations ago. And a hundred generations from today, if the Lord does not return. Jesus Christ never changes. And he's the way. He's the way. Now, you know, here at Harvest, we believe that every word in the Bible matters. So Jesus said, I am. What do you think I want to talk about next? The. You can't preach a, you can't preach a sermon on the word the. <laughs> Actually, uh, turn to your neighbor and say, every word matters. Every word matters. Uh, this is the definite article. He's, when Jesus says, I am the way, I am the the way he's specializing, he's emphasizing, he's particularizing. We understand that. What's that uh, really, really muscular guy who's in, it seems like, about half the movies that come out these days? Right, right, The Rock, right? When he says, I'm The Rock, he's not, he's, there's, when you've seen me, you haven't, this is it. This is as good as it gets. And I'm not sure about that. I've heard some crazy thing going on in Ohio, if you've ever been over there. I guess they're having some argument about which university is the most important. Because did you know that a lot of people in Ohio want to tell us that they went to the Ohio State University? How many people have heard that? Well, they're trying to make a point. They're trying to say that. And did you know, did you know that, uh, what's that, what's that basketball player from Miami? What's that guy's name again? What's that guy's name? And, and doesn't he say that he's, what does he say? He says he's the king. Well, I'm not going to argue whether he's the king of putting a ball through a hoop, but he for real is not the king. Amen? He's not the king. Bro, stop saying you're the king. There's only one king. His name's Jesus Christ. And here in this passage, he says, I am the way. I am the way. Who but Jesus Christ? could claim the definite article. Jesus Christ, as one preacher said, the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. He's God's son. He's unparalleled. Jesus Christ is unprecedented. He stands in the solitude of himself. And when he said, here it is, I am the way. Way to where? Where is Jesus the way to? I mean, he says he's the way. The way to what? The way to where? Jesus Christ is the way to everything good in your life. Every step off the path of Jesus Christ is a step toward misery. Every step onto the path is a step toward blessing and joy and fulfillment. Jesus Christ is the way to freedom from sin. Jesus Christ is the way to freedom from addiction. Jesus Christ is the way to heart transformation and marriage salvation and heaven itself. God loves you. And he sent his son Jesus Christ into the world to die the pe and pay the penalty for your sin so that you could be forgiven. And every person needs to bow the knee to Jesus Christ. For 25 years, I've had the privilege of proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ to a dark world. Jesus came into this planet, and he lived a perfect life. And he uh, died a, a gruesome, cruel death as those who loved him turned on him. But he said this, he said, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down of my own choice. 
Jesus willed himself to go to the cross. And he went there because of you and me. He took your sin, your failure, your regret, your disappointment, your hurt, all that separated you from God, Jesus Christ took upon himself. So much was God the Father's wrath poured out upon Jesus that as he hung on the cross, Jesus had to say, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the sky grew black. On him almighty judgment fell that would have sunk the world to hell. And life has many hardships and challenges, pains and disappointments. But I believe this more deeply than I ever have before. Jesus Christ is the way and you need to bow to him. You need to bow to him. That means admitting maybe that you've been wrong. Maybe that you've done wrong things because we have. Maybe that you've had wrong priorities because we have. Maybe because you've lived selfishly and indifferent to God because we have. And bowing is admitting that you're wrong. People have a hard time admitting that they're wrong. They have a hard time bowing, surrendering. I've been thinking a lot about my early sermons and in a lot of my early sermons I used to talk about how frustrating it was that I was terrible, terrible at fishing. I was 10 years old, fished with my grandfather, never caught a fish. I was 20 years old, never caught a fish, not one time, and I tried a lot. 30, I used to put this in my sermons and people would come up to me and say, I can help you. I'm gonna take you fishing and you're gonna catch a fish, but I never did. I was fish repellent. One time a man in our church uh, took me on a, a, a couple of day long trip to Kentucky. He said, you're gonna catch a fish now. He took me out with one of those ESPN pro bass fishermen who was wearing a getup that made him look like a Formula One racer. And he had a speed boat, he had all the, all the things that you'd expect a professional bass fisherman to have. We were out in the boat, I was in the middle, my friend was at the front, I was so nervous that when I cast the line out, my lure caught the hat on the fisherman and threw it right out into the lake. The harder I tried to fish, the worse it got. One of my favorite old stories from Harvest is when my son Landon, maybe, well, I don't know, maybe 10 years old, a dear friend of ours uh, in the church said, well, if you can't catch any fish, why don't we try ice fishing? It seemed like a good idea at the time, but by the time you get up at 5 o'clock in the morning in Wisconsin and drive out onto a lake on an ATV with snow blowing down your back and you, they drill a four-inch hole in the water, and I could even sometimes see fish down in the water. And I would take my bait and rub the bait over the fish. I could not get the fish to bite it, and Landon was freezing to death, so I said, well, come over and sit by Dad here, and he slid over beside me on the bench. Maybe some of you remember me telling this story, and he slid over beside me, and the pouch that I was wearing, the kind of pullover poncho kind of thing, it opened as I leaned to hug Landon, and out of the pocket came my keys. Spinning, spinning, spinning through. Have you ever seen something in slow motion? Spinning, spinning through the air. No! And right down the hole. We spent the rest of the morning uh, dangling things down. I could see it right down there, my keys. We, anyway, that was all that I caught that day was my keys. Here's what's interesting. It's really hard for me to describe to you now how badly I wanted to be able to fish and catch fish. But somewhere along the line, I just didn't care about it anymore, didn't worry about it anymore, didn't strive for it anymore. And you know, I've, I've had now up at our church's camp and in so many different places, I've caught so many fish now. Looking back, it seems like such a silly thing I was burdened about. Do you know I think a lot of people look back on their days before Christ like that? They were trying so hard to be happy. 
They were working so energetically to set up a life for themselves. They were pressing and, and, and striving and spending themselves to set up a life for themselves. And when you bow to Jesus Christ, you give your life to him. And looking back, he gives you so, everything and so much more. With Christ, you have everything no matter what you lack. Without Jesus Christ, you have nothing no matter what you have. That's why he says, I am the way. Lift up your voice and say what Jesus said. He said, I am the way. Say it. Jesus Christ is the way. Bow to him. Then this. Jesus Christ is the truth. Follow him. Jesus Christ is the truth. Follow him. I am the truth, he said. Now, the word I am isn't in your Bible again. Do you see that there? See how I am isn't repeated? But it doesn't have to be repeated. If I said to you, I went to the store and to the cleaners and to the gas station, how many people would know that I went to all those places? Right. Same, same. I am the way implied then I am the truth, not I know the truth. Jesus was and is and is to come the truth. Before time, he was the truth. Before space, he was the truth. Before matter was the truth. Colossians 1 says that of him and from him and through him and to him are all things. Jesus said, I am the truth, not I learned the truth, not I was here before you and I've need you to listen because I've learned some things. Not at all. He's not saying, I know I learned. He's saying, I am the truth. I am the truth. Truth begins and ends with me. Jesus is saying, truth is me and I am truth. In a world filled with error, in a world filled with lies and gossip and deception and despair, Jesus Christ is the truth. All in favor of truth? Can we lift up our voices for truth? Jesus Christ is the truth. Listen, you know nothing until you know Jesus Christ. You know nothing until you know Jesus Christ. You understand nothing until you know Jesus Christ. To know him is to know the truth. About everything. You say, the truth about what? The truth about everything. The truth about who you are. The truth about why you're here. The truth about where you're going. The truth about how you can get there. The truth about what God did so that you can be forgiven and have the gift of eternal life. Jesus is the truth. How do I carry burdens in life? Through Jesus Christ, he's the truth. How do I make a difficult decision? Some of you are here today and you have a difficult decision to make. How are you going to make that truth? That decision by looking to Jesus Christ who is the truth. How do I conquer those who want to conquer me? Through Jesus Christ. He's the truth. How do I break an addiction, change an attitude, grant a forgiveness, build a life, heal a marriage? change a business, establish a church through Jesus Christ. He's the truth. I never dreamed. I never dreamed in my wildest imagination. The thought never crossed my mind that there would ever be two or 3,000 people in our church. I never thought about that one time. That was so stratospherically beyond anything that we had ever known all we knew was this. We knew that God wrote a book. We knew that Jesus Christ is God's son. We knew that the gospel was powerful. We knew that Jesus showed up when, when his people adored him. We knew that prayer offered in faith persistently would be answered. We knew that bold witness for the gospel would be used. And we stepped out in faith. And Jesus Christ, the truth, has been faithful to all of those things.
25 years now of following in Jesus' steps. So happy to have my father here today. And where I grew up in, in Canada, we would, every winter, we would have three foot uh, snow drifts. And you'd walk out of the house and then you, you'd go down when you were a little kid if you didn't. The key was someone would go ahead, usually my father, to get out to the car, to get out to the street, to walk to school. You had to step in the steps of the person who had gone before. If you didn't step in their steps, if you got off the track, you were going down. There was no margin for error when the snow is, is higher than you are. That's a lot like the Christian life. Maybe you feel like I do. I, I wish that every single step I have taken was a step in the way and a step in the truth. But the older I get and the slower I get in choosing my steps, the more determined I have become through the years to step in the places where Jesus would step. 1 Peter 2.21 says that Christ suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow in his steps. That's what it means to follow the truth. Jesus Christ is the way, bow to him. Jesus Christ is the truth, follow him. I grew up in a church where the pastors that I listened to, it seemed, would pretty frequently tell the same stories over and over, over and over, and over and over. I've tried really hard not to tell the same stories, and I'm blessed because I got a lot of stories, but could you just indulge me and let me on our 25th anniversary tell my favorite story in the history of our church, even if you've already heard it? Can I do that? Is that okay? My favorite story has to do with following Jesus Christ, who is the truth. It involves a particular weekend at harvest, probably about 10 years ago, a little more maybe. And I was talking to people after the service like I was doing today before the service, and a particular woman came up to me and she was upset. She said, I heard one of the pastors in this church. He was at the YMCA playing basketball, and I heard him. He was swearing. And I said, well, I don't know if that could possibly be true. I, I said, tell me who it is. And he told me his name. And I said, well, he's just such a sweet man. I really think there must be some mis... She said, no. She said, I heard, we heard him. My daughter heard him. And I didn't know what to say or how to help her. And... So I said, maybe we can have someone pray with you. And I thought I handled it good, you know. Maybe, maybe I didn't handle it best. I wasn't sure really what to say. But then I, if you remember this story, I got a letter uh, in the mail uh, that week from this same lady. And she was very upset. She said, she said, I, I didn't feel like you listened to me, and I didn't feel like you heard me, and I didn't feel like you believed me, and I didn't feel like you believed my daughter. And I don't remember all the things she said. I just remember the letter was really hurtful and, and, and just, just hurtful. And at the end of the letter, she said this. I remember she closed the letter. Do you know this part of the story? She said, this is how she closed it. She said, you're nothing but a donkey, a big donkey. like now I think that was so outrageous that on a normal day I might have been able to just let it run off my back but maybe I was tired or something I don't know but I'm just gonna be honest you know that kind of that kind of hurt me and and so really really I'm a donkey and and not just a regular donkey I'm a big donkey <laughs> and I thought that that's mean and and hurtful and I just didn't understand it and I didn't really know what to think about it but it was bothering me and and it bothered me the next day, and I remember waking up thinking about it, and it bothered me the next day. Well, Friday came, and that's when I really work on my sermon pretty hard. And, and, but I had lunch with Erwin Lutzer, the pastor of Moody Church. We love him. I was on the phone with him last week. And when we dedicated our building in 1995, 
Pastor Lutzer came and preached for us. And Anyway, I didn't tell him anything about the lady who called me a donkey. But I was pretty upset about it. And I said, Lord, after lunch, i got to get my sermon done. you got to get this off my mind. And I prayed all the way down to Park Ridge to meet him for lunch. And God, you got to get this off my mind and just help me get over this and just let it go. And had lunch, walked Dr. Irwin Lutzer back to his car. And this was such a God moment for me. And I pray moments like this for you. Because he turned and he said to me, he said, you know, James, God's really using your life. And he said, but he said, make sure you stay humble. And I thanked him for that. We all need to hear that. And then he said to me, he said, because you know what they say about the donkey, don't you? I was so shocked that he said that. That I, I just said, um, no, no, what do they say? He said, he said, James, even the donkey knew that the palm branches and the blankets, referring to the triumphal entry before the cross, even the donkey knew that the palm branches and the blankets were for the person on his back and not for him. I was like, that's awesome. I got to go. <laughs> and I got my car down in Park Ridge, and, and, and I'm not going to lie. I shed a couple tears on the way back. It was really an important, important turning uh, point in my life. And I just thought to myself, you know what? That's right, isn't it? It doesn't matter uh, anyway what someone says or what someone thinks or this lady in this letter. What really matters is, is that what we do, we do for the Lord. And that's why we're here today. We're here for Jesus Christ. We're here to honor Jesus Christ. And I might be the person who has the privilege of standing up here, but I'm not more important than you. I'm not more important than your sister. This church is all about an audience of one. We are here to love and to adore and to worship Jesus Christ the Lord. Even a donkey knows that. Even a donkey knows. Even a donkey knows that it's all about Jesus Christ. Point to a donkey you know. Even a donkey knows. It's, and I was like, all right, I'm a donkey. All right, all right. Because it doesn't matter. What matters is, is that Jesus Christ is worshipped and adored for who he declares himself to be. The way, the truth, and then just this. And I'm going to ask you to respond to this message. So about five or seven, eight more minutes and I'm going to ask you to respond to this message. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. And now he says, I am the life. I am the way. Bow to him. I am the truth. Follow him. Jesus Christ is the life, he said. Trust him. Yes. His life. He lived he died as a payment for our sin. He rose from the dead to prove he's God. Jesus Christ is the life. Paul said, in him we live and move and have our being. Peter said of Jesus Christ, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. John, the last living apostle, said that his eyes, Jesus Christ, that his eyes were like a flame of fire. And out, out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. That he had a name written on his thigh, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That he wore a robe that was dipped in blood. John said, when I saw Jesus Christ, I fell at his feet as though dead. Now I want you to hear this. Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life. You can trust him. You can trust him with your life. You can trust him with your marriage. You can trust him with your finances. You can trust him. It was about a year ago right now that my wife Kathy had that ATV accident. I was right behind her in horror when it reared up and flipped over and I thought it was going to land on top of her, everything in slow motion and her ribs were broken and her arm was broken, her elbow was broken, her lung was punctured and what a different day today would be. 
something eternal had happened to my wife. But I would have had to trust God. And we can trust Him. I was thinking today about a conversation I had with my mother about 30 years ago. I had just finished college. And I was trying to figure out where to go and serve the Lord. And I was so burdened about it. I was sitting alone with my mother and she was rocking in her rocking chair. And I said, Mom, I'm so burdened about this and what am I going to do? And I hadn't learned very much about trusting. She said, let me tell you something, son. Out she came with a story about how that week she'd had to go to the doctor for a breast biopsy and how uncertain she was about her own health condition and even her life itself. But I said, Mom, I can't see it. I couldn't, I couldn't tell that you had a burden. How, how do you carry things like this? And she quoted the words of a hymn to me. Simply trusting every day. Trusting through the stormy way. Even when my faith is small. Trusting Jesus. That's all. Trusting as the moments fly. Trusting as the days go by. Trusting him whate'er befalls, trusting Jesus, that is all. And that's all there is. How are you doing? I'm trusting the Lord. How are you doing? I'm trusting the Lord. How's your life going? I'm trusting the Lord. Say it. How are you doing? How's it going? Are you concerned about the future? Are you carrying a burden? This is the Christian life. Jesus Christ, the way, the truth. The life. Trust him. Final favorite illustration involves the 1998 ill-fated Swiss air flight that went down off the coast of Nova Scotia. It was interesting. There was, I think, um, 229 people, this plane went down, every one of them was killed. We watched it on the news as they searched all off the coast of Nova Scotia. Never found, only body parts, nothing else. And then I got this letter in the mail from a lady. I have her permission to share this. She wrote, Dear Pastor McDonald, Several weeks ago, visiting back in the Chicago area, we had the privilege of attending one of your church services on a Saturday night. This was 1998, or a little after. It was a wonderfully meaningful service. She even referenced some parts of the service, and then she wrote, the main reason I'm writing is to tell you something we thought you might be interested in knowing. You remember almost a year ago that a young Wheaton College couple was on the ill-fated ill Swiss Air Flight 111 that went down off the coast of Nova Scotia. They were our daughter and son-in-law. We learned several months ago that the only thing that they had retrieved and identified as Julie's, that's her daughter's name, the only thing that they had identified and retrieved of hers was her Bible. It has since been returned to us and is an amazing amazingly good shape considering it was at the bottom of 190 feet of ocean water. We can even read her handwritten notes in the margins. To us this is so exciting to think that the plane exploded. There were not bodies to identify, only fragments. And yet the Word of God survived. In Julie's Bible was a sheet of sermon notes dated by checking with some of Julie's friends, they learned that the message notes were from a service she attended in our church. The message was entitled, Five Keys to Family Remodeling. And that was so appropriate for Julie as she and Barry were such dedicated parents to their two-year-old twin boys. If there's anything of hers that might have survived the accident, there's nothing more we would want than her Bible, knowing how meaningful it was to her and how she strove and prayed to be a woman of excellence for God. We felt that this was such a wonderful example of Isaiah 40, verse 8, which says, 
The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of God will stand forever. And she signed the letter, trusting Jesus. Now I'm telling you, there's no better choice that you can make than to bow to Jesus Christ the way and to follow Jesus Christ the truth and to trust Jesus Christ the life. But there's a little part in the verse that brings us to the conclusion of this message. And this is the all important moment. John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. Now, how could that be any clearer? Jesus Christ is saying, no one will be in heaven who didn't get there through me. Everyone who populates hell is there because they rejected me. Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life is the way to heaven. He's the only hope. He's the forgiveness of sins. He's the gift of eternal life. And so I have to ask you, have you ever given your life to Jesus Christ? Have you ever turned from your sin and embraced Jesus Christ for your forgiveness? It doesn't matter if you're sitting up in the balcony or out on the hillside. It doesn't matter if you've been coming here for years or this is the first time you've ever been to a harvest service. What matters is this. Where are you in regard to Jesus Christ? Have you bowed? Have you begun to follow? Have you learned to trust? It all begins with that basic decision, and though it isn't easy, it is simple. We like to refer to the gospel as as simple as A, B, C. As simple as A, B, C. And if you want to know that your sins are forgiven, if you want to know that you're going to go to heaven when you die, if you want to know that you've received God's son, God's love, God's forgiveness, you need to accept the fact that you're a sinner. I need forgiveness. The Bible says that there is none righteous, no, not one. That all of us like sheep have gone astray. That all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's you. That's me. Can you accept that? That you need a savior, that you need forgiveness? Because that's the second thing. B, A, accept the fact that you're a sinner. B, believe that Jesus Christ died for your sin. Now, no one can make you believe. And maybe some people have tried to make you believe. But no one can make you believe. Just take a moment now and look in your heart. Do you believe this? In fact, just everyone, please, let's be as still as we can. I would appreciate it so much if no one would leave Maybe someone very near you is about to make a life-changing decision. Any waiting will be worth it. Let's all bow now and look inside. Let me just ask you personally now, as though just you and I were sitting over a cup of coffee. I'm asking, do you agree? Can you accept the fact that you are a sinner in need of God's forgiveness? Just in your heart say, yes, I know it's true. Yes, I know it's true. And then this, do you believe, do you believe that Jesus Christ died to pay the penalty for your sin? That he rose from the dead? That he's alive? that he's here right now, that he's listening, that he's reaching out to you, 
that he wants to change your life, that he wants to give you everything that you've been looking for and longing for, that he wants to fill up what has been lacking with his loving presence and bring you to heaven someday? Do you believe that? Do you believe that? And then this. Are you willing to confess it? That's the C, A, B, C. Jesus said, he who confesses me before men, him will I confess be my, before my Father who's in heaven. If that's where you are, again, whether this is your first time here or here for weeks or months or years, everyone needs to bow. You have to bow before you can follow. You have to bow before you can trust. You say, James, well, how would I bow? This would be a great start. Just pray this prayer from your heart with me. And if you're a Christian, you should be praying too. Pray quietly. But if you want to believe in Jesus Christ, if you want to settle this, pray this from your heart. Just say, God, I do accept that I am a sinner in need of your forgiveness. Jesus, I do believe that you died to pay for my sins. And I do confess with my mouth that you are who you declare yourself to be. And I receive you into my life now as my Savior. Come into my life and forgive my sins and make me a new person. I receive the gift of eternal life that you provided for me on the cross. I receive it now, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand together. Let's all stand together. Right now our worship team is coming. And I'm going to ask you, if you prayed that prayer from your heart, how many people, lift up your hand, how many people prayed that prayer with me from your heart? And you meant it. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do right now from the very back right down to the front while the worship team comes. We're going to sing a song and you don't even have to wait. You can come right now. Come to the front here and I'm going to just lead you in a prayer. We have a little gift of a resource we're going to give to you and we're going to send you on your way. We're going to be here for a couple of hours. We'll only keep you here for a couple of minutes. But I know this after 25 years, getting those feet moving coming and publicly saying, I was over at that stadium in Schaumburg and I gave my life to Jesus Christ. I wanted his forgiveness and I came and got it. He, he, I gave my life to him. He received me. You come right now, even before we sing. Maybe you want to rededicate your life to the Lord. We're going to pray for you. But just come right now from all over this wonderful audience. Just come and say, I'm coming to give my life to Jesus Christ. I'm coming to rededicate my life to Jesus Christ. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus Just to take him at his word Come on. Just to rest upon his promise. Just to know the sin the Lord of home running. His arms are open wide. His name is Jesus. That's right. And he understands. Church. He is the answer that you are looking for. So come home running just as you are. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus just to take him
to come home running. His arms are open wide. His name is Jesus. He understands. He is the answer that you are looking for. So come home running just as you such a beautiful night, isn't it? I want all those of you who have gathered here, come right down here, closer to the front. And I guess I, I guess I'm a, hang on now. Let's have some of our elders and those who are ready to pray with people just come and find an individual. But listen, I, I guess I'm, after 30 years of serving the Lord, I guess I'm an older preacher now. And I've been the person who's standing out there where you are, so thankful that some people came. Thank God, thank God someone went down there. I don't have to. Right now you're just wanting this to end quickly. And yet the Bible says that love is patient. And I so wish that I could take your face in my hands and tell you how much God loves you and how he longs to give himself to you not just for the first time praise God for every first time decision for Christ but some of you you know you're not walking with God you're not living for Christ he's not been all that you planned for him to be and selfishness has come back in and pride has come back in and this is such a memorable evening we will remember this night for the rest of our lives and so we're going to give you another moment and we want to invite you in the name of Jesus Christ come and, and make a decision here at this stadium in Schaumburg and every time you go to Woodfield Mall and every time you drive up and down this, this highway, you will say to yourself, that's where I promised, that's where I said, that's where I recommitted, that's where I gave my word that I would stand for Jesus Christ and live for Jesus Christ and serve Jesus Christ. If your heart is like, that's me, that's me. I gotta, I gotta settle, I gotta settle this. We love you so much. And we're gonna sing again and I want you to come right now. Don't wait another second. We love you. Come. It is so sweet to trust in Jesus. Come on. Just to take him at his word just to rest awesome. upon his promise just to know the Savior Lord. it's not too far come on so come home running his arms are open wide his name is Jesus he understands, he is the answer that you are looking for. So come home running just as you are. So come home running, his arms are open wide, his name is Jesus. Yeah. 
you're making your way down here, it's not too late for you, but I just am so blessed to look into all your faces. God loves you so much. And every decision that you're making right now is blessing the heart of God. Do you know that the Bible says that there's more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents? How many times we've had to be that person? And you're, it brings, there's more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than a bunch of people that don't think they need to. And so you're blessing the heart of God, your first time decisions for Christ. We've got some boxes here. We're going to give you some literature, a Bible, some Bible study materials, a card you can fill out so one of our pastors can follow up with you and we can just get our arms around you and love you. Can I just pray for you right now? All right, come on now. If you're near somebody, just put your hand on them and, and let's just agree together in prayer. Father God, we come before you now in the precious name of your son, Jesus. And I thank you for every little girl who's come down to the front of this church. And I thank you for every young woman who's come down to the front of this field. And I thank you for every grown woman who has seen her need for Jesus today. And I thank you for every little boy who's standing here with his future in front of him, God. Might his, might his life be aligned with the king of the universe today. I thank you for every young man who's come down here whose life is not yet scarred by sin and awful choices. And we pray, God, that you would have your hand of protection upon them. I thank you, God, for every man who's come here and knows the sting of sin and knows the ugliness of what you forbid and is seeking your forgiveness today. And I thank you, God, that for every one of these people, you know them, God, perfectly. You know they're lying down and they're rising up, God. You know what they've endured. You know the pain of their wrong choices. And you know the joy of a father's heart in seeing them here humble before you today. God, thank you that, that you are honored in their humility. And as they bow before your son, Jesus Christ, today, we thank you that you grant to them the gift of eternal life. We thank you, God, that you grant to them the restoration of a fallen son or daughter who's coming home today. We thank you for the father who stood at the end of the road and didn't condemn the son. He didn't judge the son. He didn't demand answers from the piggish life that he had been living but your word says that when he was still far off he had compassion on him and he ran to him and he threw his arms around him and he said my son my son has come home kill the fatted calf get a ring put it on his finger get the best robe and wrap it around him. My son was lost, and now he's found. And all of heaven rejoices, amen? amen? Who could do this but Jesus Christ? Who could do this but Jesus Christ? Come on. Come on. We're gonna have some people minister to you, and our choir's about to light Schaumburg on fire. He's 
the sun of righteousness worthy of the glory Let every voice in earth and heaven offer praise, and every heart become his holy hiding place. Let every knee bow down and every tongue confess the name of Jehovah's only. service in the history of Harvest, and it has about uh, 60 seconds left. We're bringing up now all the boards with all the stickers and all the places that you denoted your story. Your story is our story. Our story is God's story, right? Just turn to your neighbor and tell him that. Say, your story is our story. Our story is God's story. And uh, it's pretty awesome to see Every single one of these decisions made for Christ. And more and more through the years, as God has grown us, as God has refined us, as God has stretched us, he that bears fruit, he prunes that he may bear more fruit. Amen? Bring that down a bit, can you? All right, now let the people give a shout and give thanks to the Lord. Amen. Amen. Happy 25th anniversary, Harvest Bible Chapel! All right, now, all the kids' stuff's still up there. There's a big uh, thing up on this side in the skybox or whatever that is for students can go up there. The worship team's going to be here. We're going to sing for a while, and you don't have to go anywhere. It's a beautiful night, and guess what? You are loved. You really are.